Good evening, everyone. Tonight's program, Changing Trends in Fashion and Body Image, Late 1800s versus Early 1900s, is one of Kenosha Public Library's events celebrating Women's History Month. I'm Patty Bajavir, adult librarian at the Northside Library. Over the years, KPL has been honored to work with staff members of community partners, such as the Kenosha History Center and Carthage College to offer educational opportunities to the general public. Abigail uh, Swihart is a second year undergraduate student in history at Carthage College with a focus on women's and gender studies. She first worked as an intern at the Kenosha History Center in the summer of 2022 and plans to continue working there during the summers. Her knowledge and perspectives related to women's fashion and body image have been influenced by her work with items within the significant W. Horvitz collection. The special exhibit in our lobby display case changing trends in women's fashion will be available to visitors and library patrons through March. Please feel free to pick up flyers about it and give them to family and friends. Before Abby's presentation, Chris Allen, Executive Director of the Kenosha County Historical Society would like to share several thoughts with the audience. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to both of them. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. I know it's um, beautiful weather out there, and uh, you know it's it's a great turnout here. Um, and kudos to Abby for putting together the exhibit. Um, Dovey Horvitz was going to make it tonight, although. Like I previously mentioned, the weather didn't cooperate. Uh, but I wanted to thank Dovey in her absence um, for everything that she's done for the Kenosha County Historical Society, um, as well as for our students present and our future students. Um, the collection came to the Kenosha County Historical Society about five years ago. And by us housing this, uh, extensive collection. It's providing opportunities for students like Abigail um, and our future students. So I want to thank um, W. Horvitz for gifting that collection of about 1,300 items to the Kenosha County Historical Society. Uh, you'll see items on display tonight in the exhibits. You'll see things in the presentation, um, but you'll also see them in years to come as well. Uh, and I also want to congratulate Abigail on just a wonderful exhibit. Uh, this is the culmination of some work with um, within our summer internship program. And at the very end of the internship program, uh, we gave her the opportunity to design the space. And I think she just did a terrific job. So without further ado, Abigail Swihart. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, uh, my the title of my presentation is changing trends in fashion and body image um, focusing on the late 1800s uh, versus the early 1900s. Um, so like Patty said before, my name is Abby Swihart. I'm a 20 year old sophomore undergraduate student at Carthage College. Um, I am from Kenosha. I've grown up here. Um, I even remember coming to this library when I was little. Um, in Carthage, I work in the history and women and gender studies departments. I interned at the Kenosha History Center. That's how I got started on this project and worked with the W. Horvitz Women's Collection, which is a collection of over 1,200 pieces of women's history. Um, so we'll start off talking about dress and body shape, um, just comparing uh, 1800s and 1920s dress and body shape. Um, the body figure in the late 1800s uh, was the standard like hourglass figure. That's what we think of as like a full bust, slim uh, waist, and a full hip. Um, that figure held throughout the 19th century. Um, 
with corsets, bustles, undergarments to hold that figure. Um, later on in the 19th century, it became less severe. Um, throughout the mid and early 1800s, we see like hoop skirts with the large bottoms and small waist corsets, um, just to really give a, an extreme hourglass figure. But later on in the century, um, uh, it fades away a little bit. Uh, so why was this hourglass figure desirable? Um, if we think in gender binary terms, uh, femininity and masculinity would be opposites of each other, um, meaning women in this time were expected to dress opposite of men, um, which the male standard figure being flat chested, uh, slim hips. Um, so then women were expected to have this full bust, full hips, a uh, very unmasculine way of dress. Um, and feminist equality movements in the 1800s uh, are what lessened the severity of that um, hourglass figure, got rid of those hoop skirts and the really small waist corsets. Um, because in times of feminist equality, women tend to dress closer to the men's standard of fashion. So even though this was still an hourglass figure in the late 1800s and still very noticeably different than how men would dress at the time, um, because it is slightly closer, we can tell through the time that it is uh, more of a push for equality in the time. Uh, so just some examples here. Um, on the left side, uh, this dress is in the display outside in the lobby. Um, and you can tell just the figure on that mannequin. She has a very small waist. Um, the dress has a large train at the bottom with bustles in the back to just give her a very full bottom. Um, and the dress is built in with extra like fabric and ruffles on the top to give a very full bust. Um, on the right side, uh, we can also see just a side view of a similar thing, just how the dress is built itself with just such a large bustle in the back um, and velvety feathering in the top and the front um, to really just make that hourglass figure as extreme as possible. Um, so types of bustles or undergarments for to upkeep this hourglass figure, um, there's plenty of different inventions on how to do this. So we, in the top left corner there is an example of a bum pad, uh, which uh, is in the display outside. Um, it's just kind of fabric made together to tie around the waist and give extra padding underneath the dress. Um, there were wire bustles like this on the right side um, to give the dress some sort of structure to hold up the heavy fabric, but also just give more fullness. Um, metal or wood structured corsets, or not corsets, bustles, but in the bottom left side, um, you can see it kind of snaps on like a belt, but that heavy metal material was more so to just hold a heavy dress up with like a train on the yellow dress we showed before. Um, and then spring coil bustles are just springs wrapped in fabric. Those are still tied around your waist. You can wear uh, one of these or a mixture of them. Uh, spring coils could also just be have like on the side of your hips, while one of the bustles could be in the back. Um, and there were a lot of different options uh, just to provide the same experience, just that very full back and hourglass figure. Uh, going to the 1920s body figure, um, we see androgynous fashion come into popularity. Um, the 1920s is pretty famous for its boyish figure. Um, that's with a small bust, slim hips, and a slim body, um, which, as we mentioned before, is very similar to like the male standard body type. Um, skirts and dresses were um, built with a straight figure to hide any natural curves in the body. Um, so why was this figure desirable in the time? Um, in 1919, the 19th Amendment passed, which gave women the right to vote in the United States. Um, and with that increase of women's rights, uh, women want to dress more androgynously, more masculinely, um, because androgyny in fashion uh, is used as a tool to show 
the equality of the sexes. So in this time, women used androgyny to show their societal position since they felt they won the right to vote. They are more equals to men in the social sphere. Um, these two dresses are both in the outside display. Um, on the left, on both of them, really, you can see just how the figure is very straight on the side. The dresses aren't built with any curves in them. Um, and at the bottom, it doesn't flare out at all, uh, like an A-line dress. There's no uh, train. Um, it's just a very straight figure um, without any sleeves either, so that just to maintain a very tall vertical look without anything extra. Um, 1920s undergarments, since corsets like on the right side here um, were used throughout the 1800s to give that very tight waist for the hourglass figure, um, we still held on to corsetry and undergarments going into the 1900s. Um, but since that small waist wasn't desired anymore, um, they just kind of move lower to cinch in the hips. So these new, these new corsets are girdles. So like that first and second picture, you can see the top of it is where your waist would be. And then they go down to hug your hips and stomach to give you slim hips and a slim figure. Um, and then the bottom claps would just um, attach onto a garter belt to hold the whole outfit together. But even though it is still a new era and we don't care too much about a small waist anymore, um, it is still very restricting. And uh, women still put a lot of work into maintaining the desired figure for the time. Moving on to hairstyle and methods um, from the 1800s and 1920s. Um, in the late 1800s, uh, women kept their hair long, um, kind of as we mentioned before with dress, um, uh, how women wore the opposite of what was expected for men, that was what's what was expected of them. So since men's hair was kept short and professional, women's hair was kept long, again, to just distinguish between the sexes. Um, however, long hair isn't practical for the busy housewife, which is what was expected of women at this time. Um, so their hair was always tied up in these large buns on top of their head. Um, and since with your hair piled up on your head, the only thing that would show that was hanging down that could be styled is bangs and just hair around the face. So you can see here with our Gibson girl, um, Gibson girls are just what we call like artistical representations of the ideal standard of beauty at this time. Um, so you can see she has her hair all tight, like long hair all tied up in her head on top of her head, but she still has curled it and styled it and best she could. And it is very beautiful. Um, methods of doing this because um, electricity was invented at this time, but it is not widely used. It is not just a household convenience. Um, so without electricity, hot curlers to style your hair uh, is heated on gas powered cast irons um, or just on top of stove tops. Um, on the left side here, you can see that is a uh, little cast iron tiny stove that would hook up to a gas line to heat up the curling iron sitting on top of it. Um, and then a woman could use that to curl her hair with some sort of protective paper to make sure the hair doesn't burn. Um, on the left side, you can see the hair curler, or on the right side, you can see the hair curler just a little bit better. It's the same type of curler that is sitting on top of that little stove. Um, but this kind would just kind of rest on any stove or flame to heat up. And then the same thing, just use some sort of protective paper to style. Uh, in the 1920s, women kept their hair short for a more masculine and more androgynous look, um, just because the, ex the expectation was men would have their hair shorter, and because we've got this new uh, right to vote showing more equality with androgyny, uh, women are cutting their hair short also. Um, 
And because uh, women are trying to prove themselves equal to men, we see more women pushing themselves outside of the domestic sphere. Um, and so we no longer want to pile our hair up uh, for work for like the busy housewife would do. Um, which also means because your hair is down, you can have much more fun with styling and there's many more options. Um, the two most notable for the time period style-wise would be curling and waving the hair. Um, in this modern Priscilla magazine, you can just tell uh, this woman on the front has waved hair, the way it kind of waves against her head. Um, some methods for doing your hair. Um, so not only did the hair length open more opportunity for styles since you're not tying it up on top of your head, um, but so did electricity becoming widespread, being more available in the home. Um, so materials like um, electricity and also plastic being invented in the early 1900s, um, it allowed for many more products to be made um, for hairstyle. Um, new products meant new businesses popping up. New businesses means new inventions, new competition. So there's uh, just so many different ways of styling your hair, uh, like different products you can use in this time period compared to the 1800s. Uh, so these two pictures here are examples of like electric curlers. Um, on the top, uh, you can see it's very similar to what we would have today, just like a plug-in electric hair curler. Um, on the bottom is a very similar type of thing, um, but designed differently. Uh, it's the, not the curler that's being uh, electrically powered, but still that base that is heating up the curler. Some more ways um, that you could style your hair without electricity, um, just because more inventions were coming out around this time, uh, is the water waving bonnet. Um, that's a little bonnet made out of different metals uh, to wrap around your head and just hold in uh, waved hair. Uh, some ideal curlers, these are like flexible pins, I suppose, that you can wrap your hair around to curl or just hold them in place. Um, and then bobbed hair curlers, um, similar to like bobby pins today, but they do uh, about the same thing. You can uh, curl your hair with them and just kind of hold curls in place. Um, all three of these are in the exhibit out front, but um, I just thought it was a good idea to show just how many different ways there were. And there are many, many more than just these that are shown. Uh, so similar trends. Uh, so a post 1920s example of a similar trend, fashion trends changed. Uh, so androgynous fashion trends appear around feminist political successes um, in the 1960s and 70s, especially. Um, we can see uh, that same type of androgynous fashion come back as the 1920s. Um, so in the 60s and 70s, we get the Equal Pay Act, uh, the ERA, which is the Equal Rights Amendment, and Roe v. Wade being passed for the first time. Um, and then around this time, because that was, those were uh, feminist successes, uh, we can see the boyish figure returning with a small bust, a skinny figure and slim hips, um, loose fitting clothing and straight shaped clothing again to just kind of hide that feminine figure. Um, yeah, and just appear that very straight form. Um, also pants become more popularized. Uh, women had been wearing pants throughout the uh, 20th century, um, but in the 60s and 70s is really when they became really popular and common. Um, and then on the right side here, we can see Twiggy, who is a famous model from the 60s. Um, and she just, you can tell she has that perfect boyish figure that was desired from the time with uh, small bust, slim hips, very skinny frame. Um, and she even has the short hair and slim dress um, that is very uh, it's very similar to the 1920s style of clothing and body image. 
Um, that is about all I've prepared for this. I this is just closing up. Um, we have we can see the difference between these two dresses here on the left side, um, just that very severe hourglass figure. Um, and then versus on the right side, we have this very straight formed uh, 1920s dress. Um, and it's worth mentioning that this these two dresses were made just about 40 years apart from each other. So that's a very dramatic change in a very short amount of time. And it's all to do with uh, women's equality really taking off in the 20th century. Uh, so in conclusion, no singular, there is no singular perfect body image. Uh, fashion and body image is a constantly evolving thing. Um, uh, fashion is fun and beautiful, um, but it doesn't deserve to be torturous. Um, you don't need to uh, have body modification with corsets or hurt yourself. It's just, um, it's an art form. It's evolving. Um, the body image changes a lot. Um, quick thank you to Debbie Horvitz, who put this whole collection together, uh, the Kenosha Northside Library for having me here, the Kenosha History Center for letting me intern there. <laughs> um, special thanks to Dr. Mitchell, my professor at Carthage College, who pushes me a lot to do stuff like this. Um, KJ De Jesus, who is one of my fellow interns at the History Center and took a lot of time out of her day to come help set up the display out in the lobby um, and the audience for listening to this short presentation. Um, and then just in the bottom corner, there's a QR code. If you wanted to check out Dovey Horvitz's collection, uh, you can scan that and see the over 1200 images of her collection. So thank you. <laughs>